Hello, and welcome to the Severe Thunderstorm Forecasting Example for Supercells. My name is Joseph Patton for weatheracademy.org, and let's jump in. For a quick refresher, let's start with the forecast cone. Remember, the forecast cone gets its shape as it goes from more general to more specific in space and time. We start with large time and spatial scales, and then narrow it down to smaller times and spatial scales as more details become apparent. Generally, for severe weather forecasting, we have our four ingredients that are needed to form severe weather. Those ingredients are shear, or winds changing in speed and direction with height. Lift, so some sort of lifting mechanism like a cold front or a warm front that will serve to initially lift the updraft, which will become our thunderstorms. Instability or the ability of the updraft to continue upward after it's been lifted by our initial lifting mechanism. That instability basically means that our lifted air parcels are warmer than their environment, so that's what we look for, for increased instability. And then finally, moisture, which is the relatively moist low-level air, which is key to condensing out water vapor into clouds and precipitation, which leads to severe weather. Some other considerations might be jet streak dynamics. So look for strong jet streaks and the orientation of the jet streak to the location where the severe weather is occurring and any remnant boundaries, which may play in as factors to where and how and when severe weather occurs. So we're gonna start this forecast example by looking at broad spatial and time scales to get ourselves oriented. Remember our forecast cone. This broad scale or synoptic scale first look shows that we've got a strong jet stream coming across the, the central United States. That jet stream can be found here. And that strong jet stream is bringing very large wind shear values across much of the central plains of the United States, where this blue shading is. This blue shading represents the uh, relatively strong upper level winds, which not only lead to increased overall shear, but also act as a jet streak. So this jet streak extending from Texas to Wisconsin is going to be playing an important role in increased upper level support for where severe weather may be occurring on this day. Remember that we wanna look for our left exit and right entrance regions. The right entrance region is circled in the red oval here over central, Tex over central Oklahoma and Northern Texas. Now that we've investigated the shear situation for this day, let's take a look at lift. The thing that stands out about lift is we've got these two fronts draped across the central United States, a cold front stretching from Minnesota down to Oklahoma, and then a dry line stretching from Oklahoma down to Texas. These two fronts are going to be our lifting mechanisms for storms which are occurring on this day. And recall that our jet stream provided strong upper level shear values generally across this area. So these, where these two things overlap are going to be where our preferred regions for severe weather are. Uh, and finally, remember that our right entrance region of the jet, uh, where that red oval was, was over this area in central Oklahoma. So we've got these factors all happening in the same area right inside this red oval. And one last piece of information we can get from here is that there's very warm, moist air located on the eastern side or the forward side of these fronts, which is going to be helping adding to the propensity or ability for severe weather to occur. So we've got um, dew point temperatures in the low 70s or upper 60s, even a 72 here in central Oklahoma. And uh, we've got warm air with 91 degrees Fahrenheit, 85, 87, 88 degrees Fahrenheit all being advected upward or pushed upward by these blue wind barbs, these light southerly or southeasterly winds are pushing all this rich Gulf, um, Gulf of Mexico fueled uh, warm air, warm moist air into this region. So we're already seeing just on these two maps, 
that central Oklahoma may be our preferred region for some dangerous severe weather. Moving on to our next variable, instability, we can measure instability in the atmosphere by CAPE, or Convective Available Potential Energy. This is plotted here in the red contours, and we can see that we actually have a 4,000 contour CAPE in central Oklahoma, meaning that there's 4,000 joules per kilogram of convective available potential energy in this region, and that is very high for this variable. That means this air is very unstable. It would just take a small amount of lift in order to create large, strong updrafts, which will lead to dangerous, severe thunderstorms. In addition, our convective inhibition, or SIN, is shaded in blue, and we can see that there's very little blue shading in this region of high instability. So these two variables come together to show us that there's not much in the atmosphere stopping any strong updrafts from forming, and in fact, the air is very unstable and will want to keep rising once that initial lift from our surface fronts uh, occur in this area. Finally, we can take a look at our last variable, moisture, in the ingredients-based forecast process. We've already talked about moisture a little bit with our surface analysis, but we can see based on this 925 millibar chart, these green contours show us where there's rich moisture in the atmosphere, and we have strong moisture over most of the eastern United States and especially the southeast United States. And we've got these, um, these winds from the south or southeast, which are drawing up this moisture being fed by the Gulf of Mexico into the southern plains, including central and eastern Oklahoma. And these low level winds are gonna be very supportive for severe weather to form because they're bringing that moisture. And we can also see that just from the surface to 925 millibars, there's even a measurable amount of shear as our surface winds were about 10 or 15 knots. And these winds with the three wind, three long wind barbs mean they're about 30 knots. So there's already some low level wind shear, which will be good for the, which will be uh, good for the formation of tornadoes. And we have a lot of moisture at the low levels as well. Here is a point observed sounding from central Oklahoma taken near Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, so this sounding represents just what one point observed in the atmosphere looked like on the day in question. So remember we started with a, a, a map of the entire United States and now we've shifted, we've gotten smaller in, in, in time and in space down to just this one observed sounding. So this weather balloon was launched from the surface and went up to 100 millibars and shows us that there were 5,000 joules per kilogram of CAPE. And CAPE is a measure of instability. It basically shows us how much warmer than our air, par our air parcel is than its environment, which means it'll want to keep rising and therefore we have stronger updrafts. So we pretend that our parcel uh, has the air, the temperature profile of this dashed dark red line uh, which is here, this dashed dark red line would be our parcel temperature. And then our actual recorded environmental temperature would be the solid red line here um, that represents what the balloon was recording the air temperature to be at that level. So notice how our air parcel is warmer than our environment, which means it's buoyant. It wants to keep rising all the way up until uh, just above 200 millibars where our equilibrium level is. And that area between our parcel and our environmental temperature, this is our positive buoyancy, right? This represents how much instability there is in the atmosphere because our air parcel is warmer than its environment. And this is essentially how CAPE is calculated or convective available potential energy. So we've got a lot of CAPE in this sounding. In fact, our CAPE has been measured uh, to be almost 5,000 joules per kilogram. That lines up with the mesoanalysis we were looking at earlier. So we've got almost 5,000 joules per kilogram of CAPE, which is a lot. That means the air is very unstable. All we have to do is lift that air to its uh, LFC or level of free convection, and it'll keep continue to rise on its own. If we look at the LCL heights or the, the lifted condensation level, that's basically the first height at which clouds will begin to form or condensation will begin to form if we have a lifted parcel. 
and our LCL heights are in this column here. We can see that a surface air parcel has a lifted condensation level in this sounding of 631 meters. That's less than a kilometer, and that's pretty close to the ground. It's just several hundred meters above the ground, which means it won't take much to get um, some sort of uh, cloud to uh, have some sort of interaction with the ground, potentially like a tornado. It would only have to extend from a cloud base that's a, about 600 meters above the ground in order to have contact with the surface. Um, in addition, we essentially have no convective in inhibition. Convective inhibition is zero. So that means there's no cap or there's no limit on how strong our initial lifting mechanism has to be in order to begin to reach its LCL and its LFC. Basically, our clouds are going to start, our storms are going to start immediately as soon as they're lifted upward. There's nothing holding back our instability. Um, we've got uh, a nice veering wind profile with height. That means winds are turning clockwise with height. And we can see that by looking at our wind profile here. Our winds are sort of turning clockwise with height. And we can also see that in our hodograph. Our hodograph is turning clockwise with height as well. So both of these show that we have got a, a, a vertical wind profile that's very supportive of severe weather. In addition, we have lapse rates, which are supportive of severe weather. Our lapse rates are in the box in the lower left-hand uh, side right here. We've got surface to three kilometer above ground level lapse rates of 7.6 degrees C per kilometer, degrees Celsius per kilometer. And we've even got some mid-level lapse rates, which are over eight degrees Celsius per kilometer. So anything um, over seven degrees Celsius per kilometer is generally supportive of severe weather and over eight degrees Celsius per kilometer is even better. You know, basically that means our air temperature is getting cooler more quickly with height. So that way our air parcel is even warmer compared to the environment because the environment's getting cooler more quickly. And it will be that our air parcels will be warmer, more buoyant, more unstable, and will have even stronger updrafts. So that's why these lapse rates are important. Uh, one other thing we can look at is our deep layer shear, which is about 230 degrees or from the west-southwest. So if we imagine that our shear is coming from the west-southwest, basically like this, remember how our fronts were oriented uh, across the central United States. That means most of the, our shear value is going to be perpendicular or across our lifting mechanism. And that's going to lead to more discrete convection or supercell type convection. This is probably going to be more of a discrete supercell event as opposed to a linear event. And that means there's an increased risk for tornadoes and strong hail. Putting all of these factors together, the Storm Prediction Center had a moderate risk for severe weather, as indicated by the red polygon or red outline here in the central United States. That was at the time essentially a level three out of four, or the second highest level they could give to a severe weather event. That moderate risk encompasses much of central and eastern Oklahoma, where we had our high cape values, our high shear values, and it even extends into Arkansas and Missouri, um, where we also had favorable conditions for severe weather. Now let's take a look at what some of those reports were from that day. Here are the preliminary Storm Prediction Center severe weather reports from May 20th, 2013. And we can see there was a large swath of severe weather of all different kinds occurring over much of the central United States. Uh, in the Midwest. We had severe weather reported from Central Texas all the way up into Michigan and even a few isolated reports in New York. These blue dots represent strong wind reports or damaging winds. The uh, green dots or green triangles represent where we had large hail uh, reported, so hail that was at least an inch in diameter. And then finally, the red dots represent tornado reports. So we can see that we had a favored region for tornadoes generally in this area. And that lines up with where we had very high instability, very low convective inhibition. This was the uh, right entrance region of our jet. We had high wind shear, 
Uh, that's where basically all the ingredients really lined up with each other, is where the tornado threat happened. In addition, we've also got some um, uh, some high wind reports and some large hail reports. Uh, and these, these black icons essentially represent very damaging weather. So anytime you see these black squares, that's a 75 mile per hour wind or greater that was measured. Um, and then the black triangles represent two inch in diameter uh, hail or larger. And that can do things like break windshields and damage roofs. Finally, we'll end by revealing that in fact, there was a deadly violent EF5 tornado which occurred on this day near Moore, Oklahoma. This radar imagery shows the tornado in action between 19 and 21Z. Um, you can see our classic supercell discrete convection with the hook echo shape. This tornado resulted in at least 24 fatalities and more than $2 billion in damages alone, in addition to all the other severe weather which occurred that day. So this shows you the gravity, the seriousness of the situation. Um, we're, doing, we're learning this to help keep people safe. And hopefully now that you know a little about how supercells form and the environments which are favorable for them, you can understand how to predict them and um, keep people safe. So thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.